it's a beautiful string for those very long. Don't wound us down. You're like, man, there's no button. I'm like, there's no button in here. I've never seen a cramp in the middle of that long period. All right. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. Supreme Court of Florida is now in session. All have cause to plead, draw near, give attention, and shall be heard. God save these United States, great state of Florida, and this honorable court. Ladies and gentlemen, Supreme Court of Florida, please be seated. Good morning. Welcome to the Florida Supreme Court. We will take up case number 21 1255, Suji versus Fleet. Counsel, whenever you're ready. Good morning. May it please the court. Brian Gowdy for the plaintiffs, Ms. Suji and Ms. Williams. I'd like to reserve five minutes of time for rebuttal. Um, chapter 733, the probate code, has two timeliness bars that use a long two-year deadline. First, in subsection 2 of 733.702, the provision extinguishes a cause of action founded on the decedent's wrongdoing. Second, in 733.710, it protects three, but only three persons from liability for, quote, any claim or cause of action against the decedent, end quote. And those three persons are the estate, the personal representative, and beneficiaries. Defendants do not and cannot rely on the first provision, in the first long provision in 702, which extinguishes the cause of action because of the insurance exception in 4B. They rely solely on the second provision in 710. But 710 does not apply by its plain terms to the Lewis Bear Company or its insurers. They are not the estate, the personal representative, or a beneficiary. I understand that uh, as, a, as a textual fact. But doesn't the, the ultimate truth of what you're arguing turn on the distinction you make between what you call pay money liability and breach of duty liability? Because at the end of the day, if, the, if LBC had pay money liability here, you would concede under your argument that it, it would apply to LBC, right? No. Okay, I help would, me understand that. I think that might make a difference with the estate which, who, by the way, never filed anything in the courts below. But I don't think it would change with LBC. I think LBC, the only provision that could potentially protect LBC in any way is subsection 2 of 733.702. Okay, so then what, what is the significance of the distinction that you make and that I can't tell if we or any other court has ever made between pay money liability and breach of duty liability. It's, 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 it's a distinction with respect to the estate, and the Pezzi court did make, they didn't use those terms, right. but they did make that distinction uh, in that the estate uh, would be the named party through the personal representative, and you would establish the decedent's liability, not the estate. The estate didn't run over my clients. Mr. Morton did. Uh, the only way that the estate and, frankly, Lewis Bear are liable here is through pay money liability because neither Lewis, we're not alleging any negligence by Lewis Bear. It's vicarious liability, which is always without fault liability. But uh, it's, a, it's an important distinction more for the estate uh, because it is listed in 733.710. And I can get confusing. But at the end of the day, both Lewis Bear and uh, the estate are not being, we're not using the term liability like you would when you say in a trial court, we're going to have a liability trial or we're going to have liability issues. Which you, when you're saying that, you mean we're going to litigate the issues dealing with whether negligence caused the legal injury. 
or the other tort. So that's the distinction. But isn't, um, isn't the, I'm sorry to interrupt you, isn't the only way, though, to get to establish liability of the decedent at this point through, isn't it through the estate? No, there's two ways. One is, and this happens all the time, we, you could just sue Lewis Beer. You're not required to sue an employee when he's alive. So you could just sue Lewis Bear and establish the decedent's liability in the, in the breach of duty sense, right. and then say Lewis Bear is vicariously liable for that. But, but, the, but I mean, but the, in here, though, the, the whole, that gets to the question of whether if the liability against the decedent slash estate is extinguished by 710, then there's nothing left for, for LBC to be liable If for. it's extinguished, right. If you treat 710 as an extinguishment provision, in other words, you treat it just like subsection 2, then I agree. And that's why we've conceded that if there was no insurance here, subsection 2 would kick in and extinguish the cause of action and we'd be out of court. It's only because of the existence of insurance. And keep in mind, it's not just we're limited to whatever the policy limits are. So I, I, I agree with you, but it doesn't, it's got different wording in the two well, provisions. Well, but, but when it says that, that it won't be, that the estate won't be liable for any cause of action, right. doesn't that kind of capture sort of both the pay and the kind of substantive liability that you're talking no, about? No, because, and it's important to keep in mind, it says, uh, the estate PR beneficiaries liable for any claim of cause of action against the decedent, right? So you could still sue them for their own individual torts if there was some misappropriation of funds or things like that. Right, but that's so, not what we're talking about. No, I know, but, I mean, but the point being here is we're talking about the liability of, and we're talking about liability in the breach of duty sense, we're talking about the decedent. When we're talking about the estate, we're just saying the estate didn't do anything wrong to my client. But doesn't the, doesn't the cause of action sort of encompass all of the elements of it? I mean, it's kind of weird to say that you're, that you're off the hook for the cause of action, but then kind of suggesting as you do that I can sort of partially sue you just to establish, you know, whether you breached a duty and I guess caused damages or something, but I don't take it to sort of the last step. Right. Well, I think that's the way the, the statutes are written, including I'll bring in the non-joinder statute, right, which expressly states you don't have to have a judgment against the insured. You just have to have a settlement or a verdict. And, you can, and the first district messed that up in that they seem to think you have to have a judgment, even though that was deleted but, in 1990. But, under the, but un, if, if you're after the two years, you'd never be in a position to get a verdict against... I mean, as a practical matter, it seems to me that you've got to establish some sort of a fictitious process here, um, because if you were really going after um, a, a, in a lawsuit in which the uh, personal representative was named, right, that's subject to dismissal, right? If we didn't have insurance, I would think. Well, but okay, that's a, the. I don't agree if we have insurance because the 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 because the the as this court has recognized the insurer the insurer for, let's put us in a Pezzi situation. There is a distinction between Pezzi in this case. Pezzi, well, but, there was but the insur but this insurance provision it is I, I'm 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 struggling to see how it affects seven thirty three seven ten. It doesn't. I'm not, I'm not making any argument that the insurance provision affects 733.710. That's where the first district erred. I'm not arguing that we're using that to somehow change 710. Well, that's where the two years comes from. No, no the, there are two years is in two places. It's in subsection 2 of 733.702 because it says it this incorporates part. this part. I understand. And so that subsection extinguishes the cause of action, and it, 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 it partially repeals 46.021, which is the survival statute. It's actually used, it reverses that normal thing where a, and a cause of action against a decedent survives his death. It reverses it at the two-year point. What 710 does is it protects three people, the estate, the PR, and the beneficiaries. It does not protect the decedent's employer or the decedent's insurer. 
So even if we didn't have Justice Kennedy, even if we only had 710 and 702 wasn't there, I would submit that we could still sue Lewis Bear and we could still sue the insurance company because the legislature used three words. And think about it, insurers, employers, and the estate, none of them ran over my clients. None of them committed a tort. And if the beneficiary well, but the estate but 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 the estate basically takes the place of the decedent. Of the the estate takes the place of the decedent, but the this is all about the the uh because uh, I mean, we, we know that dead people can't sue or be sued, right? Correct. Thank that's you. a that's a principle that we that, we all acknowledge. That's true, but we're not asking in the tort suit whether the this whether the estate negligently operated the automobile and caused the injury. We're asking whether the decedent did. If you wanted to extinguish the decedent's liability, you would have used the language you did in subsection 2. But the only way we can even talk about decedent's liability is to talk about the liability of the estate. No, because Once he's dead, he's dead. I, well, first of all, that's not... not he's not amenable to, that's to... not. That's not true with employers. I mean, we have lawsuits all the time where not even the living employee is named. And we still go into court and we prove that the employee, whether they were dead well, or but, alive, but the, the, what, what's I'm just struggling to see how the rule you're suggesting uh, is really most consistent with the law. Because when when I look at the whole legal context here, it seems like that it's reasonable to conclude that an employer can't be held liable vicariously for the actions of an employee if the employee could not have been uh, could not be held liable for those and here it's the estate and if the uh, that's what we're dealing with um, because it, you can't you can't hold a dead person liable and if you can't hold the estate liable um, I, I just uh, I can't uh, I can't see how uh, the employer can be held vicariously liable. Okay, so let me, I'd like to point you to the 1955 May case from this court, which is a different May case, the Palm Beach Chemical Company. There you had a husband driving uh, the employer's vehicle. Uh, he injured his wife, who was the passenger in the vehicle. The, the wife could not sue her husband because of spousal immunity. And this court held that the wife could still sue the owner of the vehicle, it was pure vicarious liability, no fault by the owner, for the husband's tort. And I would su suggest that, that, I'll give you another example. If you, there are, certainly if you came in, and they, they say about, oh, if you have a privilege. I agree, and they cite defamation cases. If an employee has a, had a privilege to run over my clients, like you have a privilege to defame certain people, well then the employer can't be liable. But suppose, suppose we only sued Lewis Bear here, which I had seen no things suggesting we had to sue the employee or the estate. Suppose we did that in less than two years. Well, the way this non-claim statute works, it doesn't matter whether you file an action, if you don't file something in the probate court in less than two years from the death, then you are barred from seeking anything from the estate. So under their theory, if we timely filed Lewis, against Lewis Bear, less, not, not just under the statute of limitations, say we did it in less than two years, but we never sued the estate, never filed anything in probate court, well then we'd be barred because we couldn't get the estate liable. That's not how the law works. You're allowed to establish the liability in the breach of duty sense of the employee without having to sue the employee. And we would suggest the same thing happens here with the estate. And so this is actually an easier case to decide than PESI, because in PESI there was no employer. Here we have, it is the employer's insurers that are on the hook. It is not the estate. If for some reason we were to find out today that Mr. Morton was like Jeff Bezos and had a billion dollars, 
We couldn't get a dime of that money from that estate because we didn't file within two years. But that wouldn't mean that Lewis Bear's insurers are off the hook. So the, so, so the yeah. mainly the, the, the only thing keeping you alive in this action is the fact that there's insurance. Correct. If there was no insurance, subsection 2 would kick us out because that extinguishes the cause of action. It would not be 710. It would be subsection 2 of 73.702. And that's where I think the first district got confused. There's two different provisions that do different work. Subsection 2 extinguishes the cause of action. 710 protects the assets of the estate. But, but under Alley versus Ionata, our 1987 decision, wouldn't, yes. wouldn't the extinction of the cause of action work in exoneration in either case? No, I don't think so. First of all, that was a race judicata case, and I think when you get into race judicata, you have all different types of uh, principles. Uh, here, we're just talking about statutory text. What did the legislature mean? And what it meant in 710 was to protect the assets of the estate. And, and you know, all this makes sense, too, is with the insurance, because my friend has said, well, what about us? We can't sue the employee for indemnity anymore. Well, that's why we're limited to insurance. Because, and we've cited this in our reply brief from Couch on Insurance, insurers aren't allowed to seek indemnity from insureds. If we were going after Lewis Bear, that would be unfair to them. Because they wouldn't be able to get from, if Mr. Morton was rich, they wouldn't be able to get indemnity from him. But the way this works, only the insurance company is going to pay. So it all makes sense and it all fits together in that way. And I think bringing in Alley, which is a race judicata case, you just need to interpret the text. I think I'm into but my But I'm not sure. Time. Let me just ask you one more question. Yes, sir. I don't know. It's not so, it doesn't seem like it's so much a text question, though, as a matter of the interaction of the text with this sort of background principle. I mean, you acknowledge that there are lots of cases that say that once, uh, if there's been a dismissal against the employee on statute of limitations grounds, that, and I understand that the authority isn't uniform. But there's lots of cases that say that if you get a dismissal against the employee on statute of limitations grounds, then there's nothing for the employer to be liable for. Yeah. I, and so how does, how, does, how does this fit in with that? Sure. So I think there, there's cases on both sides of that issue. Right. And, and I would, if you're going to read one case, it would be the South Dakota case. Because it, it lays out both sides. And it basically treats it as sort of a, almost like a policy type, yeah. uh, kind of what makes more sense. But which, here's the thing, I would, and I won't tell you that every case does this, but a fair number of them, and if you look at our statute of limitations in Chapter 95, 95.11 speaks about you must commence an action. It's not limited to an, any particular defendant. And so I, the, we don't need to go to those background principles because here the legislature used particular words to limit this non-claim statute. And if they had wanted to extinguish liability for anybody responsible, again, for any claim of cause of action against the decedent, all they had to do was add another thing, say, nor any other person. They picked three people yeah, or, who but could be I mean, they also could have helped you by putting another exception in 710 the way they did you know, before. I don't think we need another. I mean, obviously I mean, that gets it. It could always I, be clear. Right. Okay. I mean, but you, you're the one who just said if they had added these, whatever. Okay. No, but I'm but sorry. I you're think, you're well into your rebuttal, so we'll stop. Right. I guess, and I'll just try to. But it says for any claim or cause of action against the decedent. So who? Just as another hypothetical, suppose there was a different owner, wasn't the Lewis Bear Company. Would they get the benefit of this? I mean, they're, they're stretching this for anybody who could be liable for the, for the wrongdoing of the decedent when the legislature only listed three people. Thank you. Charlie Wiggins on behalf of the estate of Thomas Morton and the Lewis Bear Company. Uh, may I please the court? We ask that this court affirm the first district's decision below and reject the fourth district's decision in PESI. This is a case that involves vicarious liability on the, on the part of the Lewis Bear Company. And to my colleague's point, yes, chapter 733.710 does in fact protect 
under its terms, only three entities or three parties, the estate, the personal representative, and the beneficiaries. That's certainly what the statute says. But in a case where it is undisputed that the liability on behalf of the corporate employer is purely vicarious, nowhere in their pleadings, nowhere in the, in the record below will, will there be one scrap of evidence that Lewis Bear Company was independently negligent. No negligent training. It is purely vicarious under respondeat superior and the dangerous instrumentality doctrine. So this court, I submit, whether you call it a two-step process or something else, you have to take a look at Chapter 733 and how does that, and how does that affect this case, a purely vicarious liability case, um, under the common law doctrines of vicarious liability. In other words, Chapter 733 may be the start of the analysis, but it is by no means the end of the analysis. When we talk about vicarious liability, of, of that is that the vicariously liable defendant, the employer, the principal, stands in the shoes of the active tortfeasor. Here, Lewis Bear Company, because it's vicariously liable only, stands in the shoes of, of Mr. Morton. And when we look at cases like Wilhelm and Saxon and the other vicarious liability cases that we've cited in our brief, it, it tells you that we stand in the shoes and therefore we get those defenses as well. And if there's a statute of limitations defense, if there is an immunity defense, if there's some other defense that would protect Mr. Morton or his estate, those defenses inure to the benefit of the Lewis Bear Company. So, um, so just to, to answer what uh, counsel on the other side said about this issue of, in this case, it's maybe a little bit easier because they did choose to sue both the, the decedent slash estate and the company. But in a case where they only sued the company, they're not trying to make any claim against the estate, they're not suing the personal representative, et cetera. Are you saying then that you would be able to raise as an affirmative defense basically this you would kind of look back to the to this two year thing and say because you know because this would have been dismissed if you had sued um, the decedent's estate that therefore the employer gets the benefit of that yes your honor and and perhaps I can put it in a different way let's assume that the plaintiffs in this case had not sued the estate well first of all they sued Mr. Morton then they they amended it to um, add the estate. Let's assume that never happened. Because Lewis Bear Company stands in the shoes and the claim is only for vicarious, we would be able to assert those statute of limitations or rather statute of repose defenses. And frankly, we might be in this exact same courtroom under the same sort of situation that, arguing I mean, the same things here so, today. And it seems like you have, in some sense, you have a strong case with, I think, the interaction of this stuff with the background principles. but. I mean, it, what, th that hypothetical, though, does show that we're getting, it seems like we're getting pretty far from the, what, it seems like the sort of the, the goals of this statute as far as certainty for the estate, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's because in that scenario, it seems like the estate really, the personal representative doesn't even have to bother with being nominally part of a lawsuit. I mean, it, it, you know, so I'm not saying that, you're ne that you necessarily don't have the better side, but, I mean, do you agree that, do you agree that it's getting sort of pretty attenuated from what the statute is trying to address at that point? I, I don't know if I agree with that because any, you know, as somebody who's defended lots of lawsuits, Mr. Gowdy's right. Sometimes the employee never gets sued. But you always have to look at what your defenses are, or the defendant does, and is there an immunity? For example, in Saxon, the, the, the corporate, in, I'm sorry, the government entity that was only vicariously liable didn't rely on a statute of limitations or statute of repose defense. They relied on an immunity defense. They stood in the same shoes on that immunity as, as their employee did. And so to the, to the court's point that, you know, do you have to go down a rabbit trail or two to, to, to get to this point, is it a multi-step or multifactorial process? Sure. 
I would, I would agree with that. But, but multi-step processes in determining whether somebody is liable or can be maintained in a lawsuit, we've got to do that every day, Your Honor. Wouldn't it make sense, too, that it be done in this time frame because the, the employer, uh, by operation of, of law, is being sued, but also they may have defenses against themselves, against the employee. Maybe they were not operating in the course of employment. Maybe there were other defenses uh, that they need to raise as to the employee's actions, but uh, that would subject the employee, now the estate, to certain uh, liability. So it puts it right back into the two-year limitation of the statute, it seems to me. Uh, uh, uh I agree, and, and to that point, I'd, I'd like to clarify something that my colleague said during his remarks to the court. Um, uh, he said that an insurance carrier can't sue its own insured for indemnity. He's right. They can't. He didn't, but what those cases say and is, is a little bit different. They say the carriers can't sue. That doesn't mean the Lewis Bear Company can't sue its own employee. And that, for, for indemnity in a vicarious liability situation. I don't know if that's exactly facts that we have here, but as a concept of law, Lewis Bear Company could. And you might say, well, some of this is covered by insurance, but some of it isn't. Lewis Bear Company might have extra contractual damages, meaning over and above its insurance policy, things that aren't covered by its insurance policy that if things go the wrong way for Lewis Bear Company, it might have a right to recover those in indemnity from its employee. But to the court's point, it's too late for that. What do you make of your uh, these sections and the timelines that they put in place interact with each other? Um, to be honest, Your Honor, that's a, that's a bit of a crystal ball and, and speculation on my part. I, I, I think I articulated that in, in our brief. Um, uh, the lack of legislative action in the wake of May, I don't know what that tells us. Does that mean that the legislature endorsed May for the limited purposes or for the limited scope of the decision in May? Um, did the legislature pay attention to it at all? I, I can't really precisely answer the court's question in that regard. Well, I mean, we presume that the legislature knows what May and Pezzi stood for or stand for. Um, and I guess the argument that I'm sort of asking you to consider is, tell me why that's wrong. Tell, tell me why, the you know, should, should I, should we as a court be saying that um, the, the last word there um, is May and that that is the proper framing of how these two deadlines intersect with each other. I'm using that as a shorthand for what your opponent has sort of at length described as the intersection, the proper reading of these two statutes. Well, it, and, and this was argued more extensively at the first District Court of Appeal, but when we, we look at what May did, what May stands for, my argument then, my argument now, is that May was limited by its own terms to proceedings in probate court. This is not a proceeding in probate court. It's in the general civil division of the circuit court for Escambia County. Uh, that may be the best answer I can okay. give you, Your Honor. And it, I mean, Bittner and, and Pezzi were decided in the same year, right? They were decided, I believe, within 60 to 90 days of one another, I think. So they, it, it seems like at least in that sense, there's nothing really to infer from legislative inaction since you had the two cases handling the issue differently. I'm not savvy enough or smart enough to infer much of what the legislature does in the wake of, 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 of case law. That's, that's a bit beyond me. Unless the court has any other questions. Yeah, I, have, I'll, I'll, I have just one question that, uh, yes, sir. and I was just waiting for all the arguments about the statutes to end. Uh, the the probate lawyer, a number of probate lawyers filed an amicus brief in this case. And one of the problems that they raise is the fact sometimes, like, a tortfeasor dies and uh, no one knows about it. I mean, the plaintiffs don't know about it until way after the statute has run. And something like what happened here, maybe. Uh, uh, what What is, it seems like the statute provides a fix for that, where there's insurance at least. 
Uh, wh how does that work? And the complaint that a probate lawyer says, says should we uh, affirm the first DCA and accept their view of the whole scheme in probate practice as it is known, uh, that it's going to cause an upheaval in, in probate practice. Because, uh, I mean, how is it that one finds out that somebody died in the case? Uh, it, are they supposed to make that wellness calls every month? Uh, how, how does one find out? Um, I have a precise answer to your question, but okay. if I could give it a, a, a short preface, which is that uh, the argument made by uh, those amicus parties was that it makes our job tougher. Um, how do we know? And therefore, uh, and I can, I can, I contend that that argument gets pretty far away from how the court should interpret the, the, the statute. But to your point, Your Honor, uh, the, the, the essence of that amicus argument was that this is a heavy burden. How do we know? Well, Your Honor, as attorneys who are in the trenches every day, we've all got burdens. We've got lots of burdens, some harder than this. If you've got a client who wants to sue somebody, you've got to find out if the defendant is subject to personal jurisdiction. You've got to find out if the client has a permanent injury. You've got to figure out, where do I sue in the appropriate venue? Does sovereign immunity apply? Does some other privilege apply? Does the statute of limitations, has it already run? And, you know, there's probably more than you want to know about me, but I get calls all the time from people who have valid claims, but the statute of limitation or the statute of repose would bar them, and you've got to send them packing. Another question, another burden. If alive, can the defendant be found and subject to service? And so if we were to say that a reasonable and prudent attorney has those burdens, has those obligations to engage in that due diligence, we're not really far afield if we say, well, attorneys of the state of Florida, you've got a duty to inquire as to whether the defendant is alive or dead within that first two-year period. And as a practical matter, I suggest that that burden is not too tough in that in light of Chapter 733, the, the potential plaintiff's attorney, or the plaintiff for the potential plaintiff, need not check in every month. He just needs to know whether at the two-year mark from the date of the accident, is the defendant alive? If so, you got another two years if, we if we're dealing with a four-year statute of limitations for a general negligence claim. And so on one hand, I appreciate the amicus saying this is a burden for us to, get, to go and figure this out. But folks, we've got a lot of other burdens uh, that are equally as important that we are obligated um, to carry as attorneys representing injured people in the state of Florida. Unless the court has any other questions, I'll yield my time. Thank you. Counsel, you can have four minutes for rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Justice Polson, your concerns about the employer, their, their, a Lewis Bear's assets are completely safe, not because of 710, because of subsection 2, because the, we can only get things from the insurance company. This parade of horribles about how, oh, we might want to sue the employee or things like that, it doesn't exist, not because of 710, because of subsection 2. If this was only a $50,000 policy, we would only get $50,000. Um, it turns out there's a lot more coverage here, so we're here at the Florida Supreme Court. But the legislature, and, and I, this kind of segues to my second point, which I've heard nobody discuss, either from the bench or from opposing counsel in his briefs or today. What work does subsection 2 do that's different than the work 710 is doing under my opponent's and the first district's construction. It does no work. Because it's not just the short statute. It expressly incorporates the long deadline. And it extinguishes the cause of action after two years. So what work does subsection 2 do? There's been no discussion. And I don't think you can write an opinion explaining that. Subsection 2 protects everybody but the insurance company. 
subsection 710 protects only those three persons. What we have here is we have an insurance company trying to use 710 that doesn't list the insurance company or the employer or the owner of the vehicle or other people who could be liable for the decedent's wrongdoing for purposes of avo basically avoiding the limitation in 702. Because 702 says we're going to give this broad protection, but we're going to have three exceptions for mortgage, insurance, <coughs> and counterclaim. I'd like to point out, too, with the mortgage, if you open this can of worms, many people don't transfer the names of their house after uh, someone dies. So if we go more than two years, is, are they going to be able to stand up and say, oh, the mortgage company didn't come in? after the death because if you're going to you're effectively going to write out b you're also going to write out 4a and as far as uh the consequences here uh just chief justice munis the 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 hypothetical you laid out he basically just said yeah even if the employee's not named we're going to claim the the defense so what that's going to mean is that every time the employee dies there will have to be a probate estate open. Nowadays, that doesn't happen because the, the, the plaintiff's attorney is dealing with the insurance company directly, and there are a lot fewer states open. Those probate lawyers who filed the amicus brief, they're going to make a lot more money if the court keeps the first district's ruling here. You're going to have a lot more probate actions. And Justice Labarga, you're, you really didn't get an answer to your question. On the plaintiff's side, the, the only way is I guess we'll have to constantly be searching every month for obituaries and things like that because the insurance adjusters, they don't even know. They didn't know Mr. Morton had died. So, and they're the ones you're dealing with because they're the ones who are going to pay the claim. So you're going to now have it where basically you're going to shorten this. People are going to, I already know people who are saying we're going to file everything within two years. We're going to have to open a probate even if we're not going to name the employee. And the legislature, the, the shame is, and I'll conclude, is the legislature set up a pretty logical system. If there's insurance, we're going to have it over here. If there's not insurance, then after two years of the death, everyone's protected. And the last, if, if I could just say one more Go thing. Ahead. But it's just, uh, uh, Ali was more about Rule 41 in response to your question, and that has nothing to do with this case. Thank you. Thank you. We're adjourned. Thank you. All right.